Dean, our Dean for the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change, Dean Alice Hoverka. Uh, she's going to give us a welcome note and do the land acknowledgement. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nishal. Um, it is uh, wonderful to have you here and so many of you joining us this evening. I do want to begin with a land acknowledgement for two special sites. Um, one is acknowledging York University's presence on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tuckeronto has been caretaken by the uh, Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and this area is subject to the dish, dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which is an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. I would also like to offer land acknowledgement for the Las Nubes Eco Campus, which is situated on the traditional lands of the Cabecar and the Bribri peoples. So thank you very much for um, joining me in acknowledging uh, the lands on which we um, do our work and we get, gather our experiences. So I did want to offer a little bit of a welcome um, because I am pleased to announce the launch of York University's new Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. And we have a quick video to show you, so I believe someone is going to put that on quickly. So there's a bit of a teaser video that we have. change has almost arrived. On September 1st, we will be launching the faculty. And this faculty has really been um, established as a call to action. And we're really wanting to respond to the many pressing challenges facing people on the planet. And we're bringing together all of our faculty, students and staff to really um, strive for a just and sustainable future. We're gonna have new academic programs. We're gonna to continue to foster the belief that making positive change requires bold and diverse thinking, um, ambitious action and community engagement. And we want to be a faculty that's inclusive and devoted to making the world a better place for everyone. And for many, many, many years, Las Nubes as a project and now as an eco campus has been the, uh, a real gem in the Faculty of Environmental Studies. And Las Nubes will continue to hold a very special place in the new faculty. We still see it as a space of experiential learning, research on biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable rural livelihoods, as well as community engagement with the local residents, with um, industry partners, and also with the universities in Costa Rica that we're, we're fostering uh, closer relationships with. So I'm really thrilled that we have you as an active and robust Las Nubes alumni network um, 2.0 maybe, uh, to engage with moving forward. So without any further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to colleagues who will um, guide us in more conversation about this very special place. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thanks for coming and uh, much appreciated the land acknowledgement on both sites that um, I know I've had the privilege of being able to access. And I guess uh, it's safe to assume that everybody or most people on this call um, also have the privilege of accessing those, those spaces, so thank you. And that movie was so emotionally moving in like 10 seconds. So thank you for the updates as well. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Olivia, and um, I am, I guess my official title on the Alumni Network Committee is Secretary, but as Natalie said, we take a co-leadership role. Um, so I went to Costa Rica in 2016, and then again, I got to return to do my research in 2017. So being a part of this alumni network for me is really important to maintain those connections and relationships. 
Um, so I'm going to allow the rest of our committee members to introduce themselves. Um, so we'll start with Joel. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel, and I guess my role in the committee is um, more responsible with the media and communication stuff. So all the stuff you see in social media, I guess all the graphics. And so I went to Costa Rica in 2017 uh, when they had like the first semester abroad. And again in 2018, very briefly to work on this promotional video project. And I'm currently doing my master's in environment and faculty of environment and urban change. And yeah, I guess I'll pass it on to the next committee member. Mara. Hi, uh, I'm Mara. I went to Las Nevis in 2018 and then again in 2020 in February. Um, I'm part of the alumni network and just kind of floating around <laughs> wherever is something to do. Thanks, Mara. And I'll pass it to Taylor. Hi, I'm Taylor. I, um, <clears throat> I've done my BES and my, uh, my master's at the Faculty of Environmental Studies. I, uh, I finished my master's last fall and uh, I was in Costa Rica all the way back in 2014. Um, and it was a great experience. And um, I think like a lot of the alumni here at had a really positive life-changing um, impact. And so I'm sort of here collectively as part of the team to like keep the spirit of things going and see what we can do. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to have this event taking place and to jumpstart things. So uh, I'll pass it on now. Thanks, Taylor. Um, let's pass it to Perna. Hi everyone, my name is Perna. <laughs> Um, and I participated in a few classes in 2018 as well as 2019. Um, I'm one of the new members of the of the committee, so still trying to figure out my role. <laughs> uh, and I look forward to talking to you guys in our breakout session. So welcome. And uh, to you. Uh, she's our activist, which uh, she'll speak to more later, I'm sure, or we all will. <laughs> and uh, Aliyah, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everybody, uh, my name is Aliyah. Um, I just recently joined the Las Nubas Alumni Network. Um, so I'm really happy to be part of the team. And, and I went to Costa Rica in the summer of 2019 and I also just recently graduated from the BES program. Thank you. So that's our team. And uh, we hope that some of you will join us, like Natalie said, in either being more actively involved in our meetings and plannings or just attending events and uh, future projects that we hope to get started. So without further ado, um, I will introduce our, our speakers for today, which I'm sure many of you all know and had the pleasure of um, sharing some time and space with as well. So we have Ana Maria Martinez, who is the research associate with the Las Nubes project. We have Ravi DaCosta, who is the acting director of the Las Nubes project and the associate dean. And Felipe Montoya, who is our project director of the Las Nubes project and the chair of the Neotropical Conservation. So they will share with us a presentation um, and just give us a kind of overview of the last 15 years of um, the Las Nubes project. And if there are any questions, um, please post them to the chat. Um, if we have time at the end, we will have a more open uh, Q&A. Uh, if not, then what I'll do is just keep track of questions in the chat and I'll bring them up throughout the event uh, when we have a moment to, to answer them. Okay. So, yeah, yeah I'll, I guess that I'll start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, as many of you well, yeah, I think I've met most of you already. Um, Felipe, Ravi, and I are really glad to be here. I will start with a quick overview of the last 15 years of the project in the context of the creation of the Costa Rican program of biological corridors. Uh, Felipe will discuss what we have learned throughout this time, and, and Ravi will tell you about um, what we're working on at the moment. 
Um, but before we jump into that, uh, we also wanted to bring up, uh, forward a couple of points to help uh, put all of our efforts, initiatives, and work into context. Next. Um, according to a recent study, uh, since um, 1980, Central America has lost over 40% of its forest cover at a rate of 1.2% per year. That is 4,600 square kilometers per year. Uh, to give you an idea of how big that is, it's like seven times the size of Toronto. And most of this forest cover has been lost due to uh, the creation of uh, pasture land, the expansion of cropland, and to a lesser extent, uh, to processes of urbanization. An important point here is that the rate of change between um, in the last decade has been lower than that of the previous decade. Next. So, um, Concerns around the species isolation in protected areas has led to multiple local, regional, and international initiatives, such as the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor. Um, this corridor was initially mapped on a route called the Paseo Pantera, or Path of the Panther, for the tiny mountain lion that ranges from Canada to Argentina. And this was a five-year project led by the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Caribbean Conservation Corporation, with the goal to connect protected areas throughout Central America so species such as the Pantera or Panther would be able to move easily by means of ecological corridors. This idea gained strength and so by the end of the 1990s, uh, the heads of states of Central America met in Panama and uh, as part of the Central American Alliance for Sustainable Development and agreed to the establishment of what we know as the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor. Um, this idea has lost strength in the last few years, but we still hope um, some, some countries have moved forward more than others, but we hope that we can um, recap some of that strength. Next. And so following these commitments in 2006, Costa Rica form, formally established the National Program for Biological Corridors with the goal to meet uh, its international obligations and by implementing a framework. And so all the biological corridors of Costa Rica um, are those uh, light green areas that you see. And they are around 33% of the national territory. So by 2016, there were officially 44 corridors established in Costa Rica. Dark um, green areas are the protected areas of Costa Rica, and so that's an addition 27% of, of the national territory. Next. And so, as you know, uh, Las Nubes was donated to New York in the late 1990s, and um, sometime between 1998, when the land was donated, and before um, Alexander Scotch passed, um, that photo that you see there at the bottom, um, the story goes that that day, uh, Howard Doherty, who's sitting on the right side, and Alexander Scotch on the left, met with um, the Tropical Science Center, Julio Calvo, the director, and they talk about this idea of connecting the two properties, Las Nubes, which is the red area that you see on the top of the map, and Los Cusingos, the um, orange area at the bottom. And so in 2005, Howard published a paper um, describing, amongst uh, other things, how York University and the Tropical Science Center had come together to create not only a corridor, but most importantly, how this process had effectively engaged local stakeholders in a joint effort for research conservation and sustainable development. Out of this, for instance, the Las Nubes Coffee became a reality where the local coffee farmers committed to the use of more, sun, uh, more sustainable practices shifting from sun to shade grown coffee. Um, according to Howard, uh, on that paper, most of the coffee farms at the time or at the, in early 2000s were sun, um, sun grown coffee. Next. 
So after the officialization of the corridor and with the formation of um, the COAS, COAS is um, the acronym for the Alexander Scotch Biological Corridor in Spanish. And so we'll, we'll refer to COAS from now on. Um, so with the formation of the local council, the COAS local council, in which the university sits as a member, uh, a strategic plan for the corridor was developed with um, five priority areas. And one of these is research. So the York University uh, is assigned to several subcommittees and one of these subcommittees is also research. And so Las Nubes as a project has tried to recruit um, students throughout the years, responding in great part to local concerns and, and issues that have been identified by the local council. And so we invite you to check this um, several papers that we have on the publications section of our website. Next. Um, well, many of you have been part of the, of the field courses, uh, which were began in 2006. And uh, the first one was focused on conservation and sustainable development. That course ran until 2016. And in 2014, another course was introduced by FES, uh, which um, was focused on indigenous issues. Um, in 2017, after an application by Ravi and Felipe, um, a full program or semester was created, what we refer to as the semester abroad, which uh, includes six different courses from FES. Now we have moved uh, or included courses from other faculties, but Ravi will tell you a little bit about that. And in the winter of 2018, we also started a reading week course. Now to date, we have had more than 500 students uh, participating in one or, or more courses. And the, the largest sustained influx of students has been during the past three years with the arrival obviously the semester abroad. Next. So for some of you uh, who probably don't know about this, we had a brand of coffee, um, which was a, an initiative that started in the early 2000s. And, and so this began obviously, as I said, with the idea of building uh, the biological corridor and where we engaged with um, Copeagri, which is a, a cooperative based in San Isidro. And so farmers who were producing sustainable shade grown coffee had the opportunity to market this coffee through Timothy's, which was, was a Toronto-based roaster in Canada. So this partnership started in 2003 and was led by Howard Doherty from York University and Roger Sumiga from Copiagri. The coffee was mainly produced uh, in two farms in the corridor. One was Granotico and the other one was San Pedro. Those two farms were certified as sustainable, but uh, in addition to this, the coffee was also fair trade certified. And so between 2003 and 2010, um, Copeagri sold a little under 190,000 kilograms of coffee to Timothy's. Um, despite uh, all the efforts, coffee production in COAS has not been immune to compounding and challenging global circumstances, but um, we can talk about coffee at another time. Um, and uh, Ravi has also something to tell you about that. Uh, next. Um, and this has, uh, this is one of the programs uh, or the projects that we're most proud about, Casita Suv. Uh, this is um, collaboration with the library at York. And we uh, decided to enter into an agreement with an ASADA. The ASADA is the local association for water in Santa Elena, something along those lines, um, to share their facilities and to run a local library and resource center with computer and internet access and a meeting room that the whole community can use. Next. Oh, one thing that I forgot to mention about that is uh, a couple of um, our students created a, um, a program that Casita Su still uh, runs uh, for um, it's an early childhood education program. So we have had training 
um, initiatives that have been run by different people. And the homestays is, um, is one of the community engagement program uh, parts of the program that we have seen grown significantly in the last few years. And so we think that this has to do with the expanded presence of Canadian students in the area. And so a, a part of a, of a new policy established in the mid-2010s, um, sorry, um, students are required to stay with local families while they take or for the length of the courses. And so this small change has had a major impact, not only by contributing to the local economy, but also because it opened a window of opportunity for local families into a new venture of rural community tourism, which was um, something that uh, people in the corridor didn't do before. Um, next. And um, so um, in the early 2010s, after noticing that the existence of a biological corridor was in really well or internalized by the majority of the residents in the communities, uh, Felipe and the students from the 2013 summer field course decided to organize a festival to bring the community and the students together. And they call it, um, and also to acknowledge Alexander Scotch in the area and his contributions. And so um, since then, it has grown exponentially. And a few years later, the community themselves started, started to work or to coordinate and organize the entire festival. And last year, we had over 1,500 participants, people coming and different activities. And so the name changed to Expo Coas to be more, uh, I guess, wide uh, and inclusive. And, Anyway, so uh, next. Oh, this is you, Felipe. Hey, thank you, Ana Maria. Uh, so yeah, I'm not muted. Uh, great to be with all you guys and see you, even though it's this virtual modality. Um, uh, so Ana Maria mentioned um, a, a document that Howard Dougherty wrote in, in 2005 uh, talked corridor and so uh, the last 15 years Ana Maria and I we've been we've we were looking at how to respond to this article uh, in, written in 2005 and see what we've learned from uh, from our experience with the Las Nubes project during these 15 years. Um, and I just have to say that in, in that article, uh, there was uh, a, a projection, Howard already uh, projected different possible avenues of, of, of creating connectivity in the corridor and improving livelihoods. Um, so for example, uh, he suggested the, the need to engage in, in sustainable agricultural practices, in, in environmental education, in buying land uh, in the corridor for, for conservation, and uh, having community participation. So uh, we decided to look at the, these different proposals and see really what, what is, what's going on in the last 15 years, what has worked and what hasn't, and, and uh, uh, what we think might be interesting avenues of, of research. Next. So by looking at these, at these two slides, you know, you might think that the biological corridor is, is you know, a space for, for native species and uh, uh, just wildlife. But as you all know, of course, about this biological corridor and many are sites of human habitation, right? Uh, there's communities that, that live in, in this space. And um, because there are human communities there, uh, there are also political and economic interests. Uh, and so the biological corridor becomes this, this, um, this idea, this, this area, 
biophysical reality, but also and um, one of the of the big uh, uh, struggles that have that have occurred there in, since I've since I've been the, the director starting in, in 2012 was a threat of how to manage this river and 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 how to make use of it and different visions of what the the river means. Um, so there were plans for hydroelectric projects, as Ana Maria mentioned, I think before. Um, and so this this biological corridor became a site of, uh, of struggle, in that sense. Um, and and this is a you know this is this is a condition that maybe was not foreseen in Article 2005, but um, the, the human presence in, in corridor vital importance. Um, so in this case, we had farm students, artists, uh, academics, and even native species coming together to, to fight for the river uh, against the interest of, of uh, corporate uh, uh, profits. In, so it, it was it was really interesting to see how how um, how all these different communities, both human and non-human communities, came together and eventually succeeded in in defending this river that it was central to the livelihoods of the people in the corridor. Um, the, uh, the the little toad you see there is the harlequin toad. Um, this one was maybe some of you already know was covered while during our, you know, our tenure in the Las Novas, it was rediscovered after 30 or more years of having disappeared and being considered an extinct species. Um, the fact that this frog or this toad was found with community uh, participation, citizen science students, uh, uh, York students as well, in, this was central in being able to protect the river. Um, because it is an endangered species, there's laws in Costa Rica that uh, prevent the change of uh, land use change if uh, native, if uh, endangered species are, uh, their habitat will be, will be destroyed. So it's an interesting way of how the biological corridor being the home of not only wildlife, but human communities and how they come together to, to protect it. Next. Uh, one, of the, one of the recommendations uh, in 2005 to protect uh, the, the, the corridor and create connectivity was to buy land uh, for, for conservation. So even though this is not a, a you know, the wholesale Purchase of land is is not a sustainable practice uh, because ultimately local communities that are are the stewards of the land um, and what they need are sustainable livelihoods connected to uh, the land that that will. There are times and places for strategic acquisitions and. Uh, the purchase and the donation of the Las Nubes, uh, Research 98 by Dr. Fisher was pivotal, you know, in, in creating the idea of, of, of establishing the biological corridor. So that started, uh, that started the, the Las Nubes. Um, so uh, in the last years, uh, we've had uh, generous donations by Woody Fisher, uh, by Jim Love, by um, Don Downer, Adrian Perry, Lillian Wright, uh, Lillian Megan Wright Foundation, um, and even the uh, Las Nubes Student Association. So, uh, four different pieces of land, and we've consolidated an eco campus of 414 acres, uh, which we think is is in the position to continue uh, creating 
interest in research, education, and collaboration with, uh, with uh, other researchers and opportunities for community engagement. So our interest is not really to continue purchasing land, but we think that what has been donated and what has become the Las Nubes uh, Eco Campus is in a strategic position now to, to really contribute to socio ecological well being and sustainable livelihoods. Next. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, the, the Las Nubes project. Back one. Previous slide. Yeah, the Las Nubes project has, um, <laughs> that one doesn't want to appear. Huh? Next one. Um, has contributed local livelihoods and uh, the, 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 uh, the local livelihoods of, um, of communities. Um, and we've done it, uh, Ana Maria already mentioned, you know, home stays. We hire our, all our workers of the Eco Campus are local people. We hired uh, local professionals to construct our, our, um, our center. Um, the, the Las Nubes um, uh, has been involved in, compa in capacity training for, for the local communities. But one thing that, is, uh, that really stands out is how these communities are resilient um, in and of themselves. And especially uh, during this time, these difficult times of the COVID, uh, many initiatives have emerged um, that strengthen local uh, markets. So this, the, the slide that we see here is an online market of, uh, of small scale producers in Perez Celedon. And this, like many others have emerged that um, promote yeah, local exchange. Some of, some of, these, um, some of these initiatives are a barter in the barter system. So it's, it's been really interesting how they have uh, found ways to, to cope with these difficult times in sustainable ways. Um, always interested in, in staying in the land in the biological corridor as, um, as inhabitants there and um, this connection with, uh, with the land. Next one. So just um, to finish this section, uh, you know, we, we ask ourselves in this article that we're writing, Ana Maria and I, is you know, our biological corridor is a panacea or is this biological corridor a model? Um, and we think that it, uh, it is one, uh, one way of, of uh, promoting sustainable livelihoods in, in a framework where, where in, in the coexistence with other in species is, is part of the, of, of the equation. Um, so the thing about biological corridors is, is that it allows us to think in different ways. Um, and our presence there it, as, as a university with uh, initiatives of education, um, research, and community engagement, we think that uh, there are many opportunities to continue making this biological corridor uh, interesting model, a model that can possibly uh, provide lessons to other communities uh, around the world. So I'll pass it on to Ravi now. Uh, thank you, Felipe. Uh, hello, everyone. It's great to see uh, so many people. I, I know quite a few of you, those of you I, who I don't. Uh, uh, it's great to have you all here. Um, so I'm going to talk about where we are now and well, obviously we're on Zoom, where else would we be? Um, before the pandemic, uh, just before the pandemic, it feels like a very long time ago. Um, Alice, Felipe, Anna uh, and, and I took the president of York, Rhonda Lenter, down to um, Las Nivas for the first time 
and you see that uh, picture of her um, with Gretel and Felipe and Alice is there with Louise Angel and Oscar uh, and Deandra. Um, uh, so, and we had a really, that was, was it feels years ago now, but mid February somewhere like that. And uh, we had a really, really excellent trip um, and uh, had a lot of meetings for the president uh, um, that I'm going to talk about um, because we're, they, they've led to things that uh, are ongoing. I mean, of course, just a few weeks after that, the world sort of started to crumble. Um, uh, and, you know, things have stabilised a little bit, uh, but it sort of took us, yeah, we, we, we finished that trip with a great deal of momentum and energy and, and uh, just had to kind of pause on some things. Um, but, yeah, so that was a, a really important um, moment because, um, you know, when, when you ha have your, you know, uh, president come down, it's, uh, and as those of you who know who've been down, uh, uh, to the place. Once you get there, you see um, why uh, people like Philippa and Anna, Anna and I always go on about uh, about Bassanibis. It's a, it is an extraordinary place, uh, and we have an extraordinary facility as well, uh, as well as incredible relationships um, with with the community and with businesses um, um, and with conservation groups uh, and, and many indigenous uh, communities and so on. So. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the things uh, that we've been doing. So when we developed the semester abroad, um, we uh, the idea was to move from a single field course to, to many courses. Uh, you, know, you knew the, the, the eco campus was gonna be built, so, um, uh, well, we thought better use it. And uh, so we started developing, that, that was the, the genesis of that. Um, uh, program and, and uh, uh, project and and right from the outset we've had other faculties and other you know programs um, participate um, uh, for right from the start there was an, a course from education and also you know uh, from you know the start of uh, the last news field course that Howard taught there's always been lots of students from um, programs other than the BES and MES um, um, and and so kind of building on some of that that uh, history and legacy, uh, we we began the process, um, uh, which uh, really Anna uh, has has um, uh, in, uh, uh, created a, a really uh, an excellent framework for helping uh, people in other faculties uh, and indeed our own colleagues as well uh, think about what their course objectives are and develop a course that's, uh, that will fit into the last nearest context. So taking learning objectives and thinking, well, what are the, the sort of experiential education opportunities? Who are the partners that we know? Um, what are the places and sites that we can visit and so on? And so we've had courses um, uh, from education and, uh, and health uh, running down there in the last few years. Uh, and in recent years, um, Anna and I have uh, had many conversations with colleagues um, from profs from right around uh, York. I don't think there's a single faculty we haven't met someone from, Anna. Um, and uh, we're very keen to keep developing um, course offerings from different uh, from units. And, and health is... Uh, has probably been the most uh, involved so far. Uh, they've got a global health program that's been really quite active. And, and in fact, several people from global health came down with us uh, or were down at the same time as, as us uh, in February. Uh, so over the next little while, we'll see um, uh, more courses develop. Uh, and uh, even though we're now you know, just stuck on Zoom, uh, we are, we're, you know, meeting with people and met with someone from engineering recently um, uh, with Anna to talk about a course idea. Uh, so that's the vision. We'd like, you know, many, well, like all the faculties to participate uh, and use uh, our, the Las Nevis Eco campus um, and students from many programs. And those of you who've taken courses know that, you know, you would have met uh, students from other programs. So, you know, so uh, I'm, I realize I'm, uh, 
going on a bit long. So uh, next slide. So um, research projects. This is a photo actually uh, of a workshop that, that Felipe did. I think it must have been just before the pandemic too. It was March, early March, I think, um, uh, bringing a lot of uh, Costa Rican based researchers together at the at, at Eco Campus for a, a kind of a, a scoping study. Maybe Felipe will talk, can talk more about that in the uh, in you know in the breakout sessions, uh, but um, identifying a lot of different kinds of research interests. Um, one of the things uh, we had many really good meetings when we were down there in February. One especially good meeting was with uh, um, a group of, of researchers uh, from the University of Costa Rica, who we've had a, a, a partnership with for a very long time, um, and uh, it uh, from that we have been developing a, um, an idea around a collaboration between York researchers and, and University of Costa Rica researchers. We've done you know, smaller scale projects before, but we're gonna try and build something uh, a bit bigger, uh, which reminds me, I'm, uh, the workshop is actually tomorrow morning finally, and uh, it reminds me that I haven't done my bit for it. So. Um, uh, but that's happening tomorrow and it's got, uh, I think we've got about seven or eight researchers from Costa Rica, uh, from the University of Costa Rica, a couple who are based in, in different countries right now. Um, and then there are ooh, at least five or six York-based uh, researchers from here, Felipe, obviously, and myself, and uh, James Lubinsky from Global Health, some, some folks from Disaster and Emergency Management um, are gonna join us as well. So that's a, a, a project um, I'm in a meeting we're looking forward to tomorrow to uh, try and uh, develop something. The goals would be to um, uh, run workshops and activities using the eco campus and to really to, to create opportunities for graduate student research and to, to deepen the partnership we have with the University of Costa Rica. Uh, so the next slide. Okay. Um, so um, Anna, do you want to talk about this? This is the project you're doing with, um, with Julie, isn't it? Yeah, Anna, go ahead and explain yeah. a little bit about this. Go for it, mm -hmm. Okay, well, this is, a, yeah, um, a, I guess inspired by the fact that a, we were all grounded in our homes and there's no travel a, a, because of the pandemic, we began to see how we can, you know, make this experiential uh, education still available to students at York. Um, so in discussing with, also with health, uh, um, Julie, Julie Hard, she's involved in the in student placements and internationalization. Um, we came up with the idea of, of um, developing a series of documentaries based on uh, the different course material of of the six or seven courses that Tops have offering at the semester abroad, um, and so this is really in the in the last uh, the last month has really uh, moved forward um, with the idea of, of developing short documentaries or mid-sized documentaries, thirty to forty-five minutes each, um, on different uh, topics in the Brunca region. So it's an exploration. It focused in the Burunka region, which is where the biological corridor is, um, from many different uh, angles and including the voices and you know the, the perspectives of local communities that we have come in contact with and 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 have as as colleagues down there. So um, this is a project. You know, we're already we have two um, uh, two episodes, so to speak. That have uh, that are moving forward. So the first one will, one will focus on the family farm and its position. You know, its the struggles, the, the the bounties that it has, and the possibilities it has in the future, and especially in this this era of of lockdown. Um, the second one, the second episode, has to do with migrant workers and also the difficulties they faced under the pandemic especially in the area of health. So 
uh, right now we're in the midst of, of um, writing up a, a project for, for a large grant in order to continue the um, uh, documentary uh, series for a couple of years um, as a complement to people who might not be able to try and have the, the experience but would like to get close to, to, um, to the reality in the region. So we're really excited about that. So, um, okay, so I just, uh, I don't know if, uh, um, uh, uh, how well you can see the text, but I wanted to show you this. Um, uh, it's something Joel worked on and it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. So, I mean, one of the other things I do is I'm currently the chair of the President's Sustainability Council at Book, and um, uh, recently, well, actually, we have a new academic plan at, at York, um, and it includes the Sustainable Development Goals. And recently, the provost um, asked me to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, help her develop some things um, in relation to that. And this is one thing that occurred to me about the ways that we think about uh, what our work does in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so Joel did this and and thought through the um, uh, with Anna thought through the 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 ways that uh, the Last Inhibits Program in, in different respects contributes to uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, um, it's a really nice file actually, so maybe um, we can share it with um, with everybody I'll put that into or Joanna if you could put that file into the general chat that would be great um, and then uh, yeah I need to wrap up um, uh, maybe the last slide okay okay great um, so uh, last thing, um, one of the other great meetings we had uh, we were down there with the president um, uh, in February was with Kobe Agri. And um, as Anna told you, uh, there has been a, a Café Las Nubes was, uh, was something that was alive and well when I first came to York in 2007. Um, and it, you know, it lasted for some more years than that, and it, but it's gone into um well it sort of ended and i think the you know, we've we've long wanted to um uh to revive this and and this year we were able to see how we might be able to do that and um the copy agri is produ is oh, there's some more organic producers in there um uh in in the Cope Agri network now uh, and so we're hoping to import uh, 80 quintals which um, uh, we think is about um, 1600 pounds or some hun well 100 kilos each for quintal uh, um, Daryl tells me it's less but um, anyway it's 80 quintals which is a modest amount um, but probably given it's a pandemic it might actually be end up to be quite a lot uh, that we uh, might be able to import to York and uh, brand as, as Last Minute's Coffee again. Um, we have uh, reasonable dreams, I would say, of having a cafe on campus that serves Last Minute's Coffee and other uh, uh, sustainably procured, locally sourced um, products, but also becomes an opportunity for uh, green business uh, types of um, uh, experiential education opportunities as well and there's a lot of interest uh, in um, uh, uh, across the university actually in, in, in those in that initiative so I'm hoping that that comes together fairly soon and I think that is uh, all so um, I'll hand it back to Nish so um, I'll hand it over to Natalie uh, but while I'm here, thank you, Ravi, uh, Anna Maria, and Felipe for sharing the 15 years that have gone by and also uh, what's to come in the future. Um, thank you for that. And Natalie, if you want to take over. 
Sure, thanks, Michelle. Yes, thank you so much. So we were originally planning to have some breakout sessions so that we could, you know, create a smaller group vibe because we so wanted this relaunch to happen, you know, in person so that we could have some kind of one on one connections with all of you. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time today, but that's okay because we heard such wonderful stories from Ravi, Anna Maria and Felipe and we thank you so much for sharing those. Um, of the stories of Las Nubis, of the Alexander, Alexander Scutch Corridor, and those partnerships, those important partnerships between um, these areas in Costa Rica and, and York University. Um, a fantastic overview, really, of both those human and non-human relations, as Felipe um, so beautifully spoke to, and how those have developed over time and strengthened over time. So um, before we wrap up, I just want to say a few words about the Alumni Association. So really what we're hoping to do um, is kind of these, th these two pieces where we're hoping to establish um, ourselves as a social group where we can continue co to connect and uh, network with um, alumni who are who are interested in you know that transdisciplinary um, lens too because the last new base project has been interesting um, as Ravi spoke to and Anna Maria in, in bringing together so many people from different faculties so it would be great to continue to connect with all of you in that way um, but also we we want our group to be able to support um, all of us alumni to continue to be connected to the communities in Costa Rica who have uh, welcomed us so warmly um, and, and shared that space and that learning with us. Um, so moving forward, we would love to get your input on uh, what, how you think this, this uh, alumni association should kind of take form and take shape and what kind of events you might want to see um, continue uh, online, but um, also hopefully eventually uh, in person as well. So we do have some um, upcoming uh, talks that we will have in one in the fall we're aiming for and one in the winter that will look like this and hopefully we'll have more time in those to meet in smaller groups. Um, at one of them we're going to be talking about uh, previous research that has happened in the corridor and, and on the other we're, we're excited to welcome people from the community um, who, you, who you may know and, and um, from your time there and if not get to know if you decide to go on some of these semester abroad um, trips. Uh, and learning experiences. Um, before I, oh great, the, the email's there. So uh, Nishal's gonna share the email in the chat, but we can also see it um, presented here. Um, but before I, I hand it over to Taylor for uh, kind of a conclusion, um, I wanna call on Prane. I wanted to talk a little bit um, about a pet petition. So part of what we wanna do too is, is get involved in uh, community causes and community concerns um, in, in, in those communities, again, that, that have welcomed us. So I'll hand it over to, to, to Prana. Thank you, Natalie. So just a word of caution, I do have unstable internet connection, so hopefully I'm not cutting out too much. So um, a lot of you spoke about how you wanted to still stay connected to the communities in Costa Rica and support initiatives. So we wanted to discuss with you one of the ways that you can do that remotely. Um, in a couple of courses that you may have taken, many indigenous communities in Southern Costa Rica have welcomed us uh, students into their homes to share their stories and um, share with us so that we could better understand their struggles over land, resources, climate change, and globalization. Um, over the past few decades, indigenous communities in Costa Rica that have attempted to reclaim part of their ancestral lands have faced um, many hardships through the ju uh, judiciary system. So to give you a bit of uh, background, in 1977, the government of Costa Rica established laws to outline a legal framework for indigenous reserves, but the procedure is very bureaucratic. It involves many institutions. The process is not simple and it's, uh, it's lengthy and it's costly. And what makes the situation worse is the violence that these communities face around the land reclamation process. Some of the communities have been fighting through the judiciary system for over six years. Uh, some cases have taken up to 12 years to resolve um, and some are even fighting with big corporations like Del Monte, which is known as Bindeco um, in Costa Rica. So while some of the communities in Costa Rica are fighting through the judiciary system to uh, reclaim their land through a peaceful way, a few of us have started a petition to support their cause and garner international support. Uh, the petition basically aims to uh, urge the government of Costa Rica to honor indigenous land rights and protect these communities from the violence that they face. Um, so if you go to change.org forward slash indigenous, 
You can read more about the petition there and um, sign it. And you can support us by basically sharing this with your friends and family and network. So thank you. I'll hand it off to Taylor now. Yeah, so I just want to thank everyone for joining our first uh, official relaunch event. And um, to stay tuned, I think you can see in the chat there, uh, we are on Facebook and Instagram. So in the meantime, uh, make sure to connect with us. And we're looking forward to um, continuing our sessions in the fall. So uh, stay tuned. And uh, we're looking forward as well to hearing a lot more of your ideas in terms of um, input. So again, thank you so much for everyone uh, attending. and organizers here and uh all the best pure vita yeah uh one more thing uh we also want to thank the people who helped us set up this uh jennifer and joanne uh from the alumni office uh they've been such great help to us um so just a big shout out to all them and again once again thank you everyone for attending this great event uh, uh the first relaunch it's officially a relaunch and we're uh happy to uh continue this journey Thank you, everyone. And, and another one more thing. <laughs> Last one, I promise. Um, I know that there's a survey that's going to be distributed through uh, the alumni office. So that's another place that you can um, tell us your feedback about what kind of events you want to see uh, in the future. So yes, to echo everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope to see you uh, very soon at the next event. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Uh, thank, you, hey, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Bye. I hope you yeah. all enjoyed. <laughs>